really need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Buffalo What's Next. I'm Angelie Preston, and today's guest is the lovely Vanna Du. <laughs> Vanna Du is a drag artist performing at venues throughout the Western New York area. She most recently designed the costumes and designed the makeup and the wigs for the Broadway play Kinky Boots, which ended its run at Shays earlier this month. Vanna, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> hey, Diva. How are you? I am I am good. I'm sweaty, but isn't that kind of like standard <laughs> when you're wearing a, a three-foot wig? <laughs> So we are a radio, and no one can see oh. how Vanna looks, but she looks Disgusting. fabulous. Yeah, oh, sorry, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so, Vanna, let's talk about your background. Yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I'm born in Rochester, and then we moved to Baltimore when I was like four and a half, five, somewhere in there. But I did most of my like growing up down in New York City. Lived there for, I think, a total of 11 years. So wow. New York is where I say. Yeah. And how did you start getting into drag? <laughs> uh, <laughs> by accident, and accidentally haven't stopped. Um, a dear friend of mine, Marty Gould Cummings, who is now a politician down in the city and like doing all these incredible things, um, was doing this weekly drag competition, like, ran for two months and had someone drop out at the last minute. I had done drag one time for a party. And so they messaged me and they said, hey, I know you have a wig. <laughs> like, <laughs> Can you throw together an outfit and come compete in this? And I was like, no, 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 no. This was also like, mind you, before the drag renaissance. So this is before Drag Race was the biggest show on television. Like it was before all of that. So I was like, no, it's not for me, but I'll gladly come support. And they kept persisting and persisting and saying, please, please, please. So I ended up saying, you know what, fine, I'll, I'll come do it once. And if I hate it, I'm never doing it again. And I hated it. Surprise. <laughs> I like, during my first number, I fell and there, I was like, oh, I, oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. And Marty backstage was like, just try one, just one more time. They were like, you've got, you've like got something about you that like, it just, it's for you. So I said, fine, I'll do one more week. And then the next week I performed um, I'm the Greatest Star from Funny Girl, which is a Barbra Streisand movie and um, killed it. Won the week, did the whole, <laughs> I mean the whole thing. And then I was just like addicted from there on out. And so... Haven't stopped since. I mean, that's uh, it's been almost seven years now that I've been doing. I was it. just going to ask, yeah. how long has it been? How twenty sixteen? How, how old were you when you first started? Twenty six. Is that late for yes. a drag performance? Oh yes. When do when do performers typically start? God, <laughs> these days they're starting at like twelve. I mean, there's <laughs> like I mean there are kids that are doing drag, which is great and like good for you. But um, I started at twenty six, which is a little later in the game, and I actually think that has a lot to do with why I consider myself more of like a personality. That sounds so arrogant. Than like a performer. Um, so, like, I love hosting events. I love talking and telling jokes and um, doing comedy and all that. And, like, I sing and dance and do all that stuff. But, like, when you know who you are before you put on the wig, it just sort of magnifies it in a way. Whereas, like, if you're starting when you're 16, like, are you the same person now that you were when you were 16? No, absolutely not. even not. at all. But So it's like, yeah. if you start one then before you know who you are, you sort of grow into someone who's like, drag is who I am. But, like, I was a whole person before I started doing drag. And this just kind of, like, informed what my life was going to be from there on out. So um, you mentioned that some children mm. start as young as 12. Mm. Governor Ron DeSantis, mm. he signed a bill in 2022 <sighs> that is colloquially called the Don't Say Don't Gay say Bill. And the bill, it's House Bill 1557. It's, it's called the Parental Rights and Education Act. And basically what it says is that it, it bans class instruction by school, 
on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through third grade. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, of course. Ter- I mean, that's so stupid. It's stupid. It's like just because we can't instruct it in school doesn't mean it's going to like make it go away. There's all these laws that are even like the Tennessee of it all. Everything that's happening is so terrifying for people like me who like don't outwardly appear to fit in a gender box or who may express themselves differently or whatever. As someone who has been kind of outwardly queer since I was like seven, six or seven, I mean, everyone knew I was gay before I knew. That's like terrifying to think about. Like I I did, um, when I was in elementary school, I did a production of Oliver based on the Charles Dickens novel, Oliver Twist. At one point I put a mop on my head to like wear as a wig and that would be illegal in these circumstances. Like to put a mop head on because it's parading as quote, a gender that isn't the one I was assigned to. I can't imagine how much creativity is going to be stifled because of it, how many lives are going to be lost because of it. Like if I, I don't know, I I don't know what my life would have been if that was what I was living through. You mentioned when you were six or seven, that's when you realized that you didn't fit inside a box, Mm -hmm. that you were different. When you were coming into who you are through adolescence and through being a child, what was the response (laughs) from your parents and from your closest, your loved ones? Yeah. Well, my mom is, <laughs> my mom is the best. I love my mom. I'll, um, my, when I went to come out to my mom, she was like, oh, I know. She was like, oh, no, you're not surprising anything. Does he want to come over for dinner? I was, I was like telling her that I had a boyfriend. This is when I, the summer I was coming back from college, my first year of college. It was like, so I've been sort of dating this guy. She was like, oh yeah, Andrew. Yeah. He can come over. She like, knew, she, they know they, they, there's a connection there that like, is unspoken. My mom knew I didn't really have much struggle with my family at all because I've been so, for lack of a better term, flamboyant since I was young. I mean, the first concert I went to was Elton John. The set I was like, I was eight maybe. The second was Britney Spears. It's like, these are sort of like <laughs> warning signs. It wasn't surprising to anyone in my family. It wasn't surprising to really anyone. Uh, and I was lucky to have been in the theater at that point where it's just so widely accepted. I didn't have much adversity in terms of coming out or expressing who I like am to my family. I know a lot of people who did, uh, and I know that it's a huge, huge epidemic in our world that there's like, I can't believe, I can't, I mean, sorry, I'll get emotional. Imagine being a parent and like raising a child and they reveal some sort of very minor aspect of who they are to you and saying, well, I don't love you because of that. Just one aspect of like the many, many things that make up a human, that's reason for some parents to kick their children out, to not speak to them any. Like, you've been raising this human for years and you grew them, potentially. I mean, you know, it's like, it's terrible. It's terrible. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I had a very easy go of it, thank God. And um, shout out to my mom and dad who made a... Can we talk about, uh, because you you mentioned the queer community. Mm. And at one time, the word queer was used as a slur. Oh, yeah. I talk about this all the time. Talk about reclaiming that word Mm. in the community. It is still a word that... So, like, I'm... (laughs) A lady never reveals her age, but I'm 33, and... Growing up in the 90s, that was a word that was, like, hurled at me a lot when I was getting beat up or shoved into a locker. I personally still struggle a bit with it, but I know it is sort of a catch-all term for anyone in the LGBTQ. So many letters. (laughs) So many letters. It's a catch-all term for just someone who, like, doesn't, who's not heteronormative. I hate that. Heteronormative. Heterosexual, I should say. (laughs) I still struggle with calling myself that because it was just levered so against me as a kid that it does have a certain like ah, <laughs> like danger to it. I know that it is a great word now, but I struggle with it. It's, it's just a personal thing. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I love it. I think it's great for people who identify that way. I personally am just like, I don't know what it is. It's- I'm working on it. But do you feel like it's kind of still a trigger for you in some ways when you a little hear bit? It? Yeah, a little bit. It was an insult growing up. It's like, and that's, of course, what it is to reclaim a word, to like find power in something that at one point hurt you so much. I just am not there yet with that particular word. There's a lot of other ones that I love, but that one in particular. 
So when you were growing up mm. and you were being bullied, with the LGBTQ community being more visible mm. in media, do you feel like that back then that would have helped you? Or Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, my example of a queer person growing up was Jack on Will and Grace. That was about mm. it. That was like, I actually can't think of, an, and like Bert and Ernie, but like they're not, <laughs> does that count? Am I allowed to say that on NPR? <laughs> like, <laughs> we all know, right? <laughs> the jig is up, diva. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Jack was like my only, I, and Will, I guess, but um, Jack was like the only thing. So it was like, oh, this is what gay people are. They're loud and they're annoying. Hilarious, but loud and annoying. And so I was like, well, I don't really think, that's me. I, it's just a very confusing thing. We didn't have the representation in the media. Or if we did, it was like a one-off episode of Friends and they come in as the as the butt to a joke. And look at the movies that were popular in like the late 80s, early 90s, which are like Tootsie, Mrs. Doubtfire, Ace Ventura. All these things are like using being trans as the butt of a joke or as like a, a scary thing that a means to an end on like, oh, I got to win the woman, so I got to like dress and drag. It was a disguise to do something nefarious in a way. So like it's very exciting that now we kind of, or the people who know, know that that is not reality. But growing up, those were the examples. And it's like difficult to come to terms with something in yourself when you don't ha really have a positive example of it in the media that you're consuming. Because, like, isn't media what raises us, really, in a way? I, I mean, I got to yeah. tell you, top model raised me a little bit. <laughs> Miss Tyro's getting fierce. I said, I love her. <laughs> well, now, granted, <laughs> was she doing it in the healthiest way? We'll get to that later. But, but like, stuff, Project Runway, top model, that was, like, those were the first times I saw queer people that were, like, fine, well-adjusted, normal humans, living their lives fully. But when it's, like, Jack on Will and Grace, which is hilarious and a great show, that's, like... <laughs> well, that's not me. So who am I? Like, I can't be that because I don't know. It's a, it's th That was what it was. But now Drag Race is the biggest show on television. Now we have reboots of shows and characters are being rewritten as trans characters or, or all of this beautiful representation in the media can be nothing but helpful. Nothing but helpful. Do you, I wish. <laughs> do you think that with all this uh, representation in media that there is still work to be done? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, there's always work to be done. If 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 we think the work is done, then like something is wrong. There's always work to be done. Everyone can get their slice of the pie. And if it's like, I mean, look at what just happened to Roe v. Wade. We're living in a society where like they're actively trying to take away humans autonomies over their own bodies so like you know i w <laughs> i'm gonna backtrack to get back to this point i went uh in grad school we had eve ensler came through the theater i was getting my degree at and she did a show called in the body of the world which is very autobiographical and it's about her um battle with her own cancer but uh she did a talk back one night talking about um, just like human rights in general, not any particular groups. And she she put it in this beautiful metaphor that I'm absolutely going to mess up. But it's like each group of humanity thinks that they have their own silo, that they're like, I'm protecting my silo and I got to just like, like my silo is the LGBTQIA plus silo. And I'm only fighting for this because that is the only thing that affects me. But if we're all just sort of like standing outside our own silos <laughs> or like, Silo is a, a crazy word that I've now said a hundred times. Um, and not like only protecting what is ours, then no one really wins. No, You have to fight equally for everyone because that's what equality is. When everyone has the same stuff or the same protections under the law, the same whatever, it's that's like, what you have to do. You fight for everyone. You don't just fight for the only things that apply to you. You have to fight for everyone. It seems like if you only fight for one thing, that kind of, adds more to the segregation and Hello. to the discrimination. Yeah. I mean, let's let's put it this way. If women of color didn't exist, gay men would have nothing. This is like we have built everything on the backs of women of color. Like period pl plain and simple dot com. 
we have built everything on the backs of women of color in the queer community. And it's like, why are we not going to fight for that? They're the first people to pick that up, uh, to pick up a sign and march and pride with us. Like, why aren't we going to fight for them? Let's talk about that. Go, go, um, because I'm curious, go into detail um, more about that. Okay. When was the last time you were at a bar and heard um, someone say like boots or sleigh? Like that comes from ballroom culture, which obviously was recently made popular again by shows like Pose and Legendary and all these amazing, amazing programs. But like that, that is largely based on trans women of color and their isms and their colloquialisms and all that stuff. And then gay men pick it up and it integrates into our vocabulary and our vernacular. And then the rest of society gets it. So like literally everything that trickles down into what is popular speak comes from women of color everything i mean like yeah the you know we always joke that there's always like the yas girl at brunch there's like the girl who's like (laughs) wearing a little party city like pink wig and she's like (laughs) yas and like she wouldn't have yas if it weren't for the ballroom scene like truly you are hitting the point (laughs) that i have notated down because (laughs) the pink party city wig you said oh wait let me throw that out real quick (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Let me get rid of it. Yeah, no one has uh, those. No one you has like the gently pink... shove it in the trash can. <laughs> Take out of my car. <laughs> the ba- ballroom culture. Oh, yeah, I love. Talk about, uh, are you part of the ballroom culture? No. God, I would never pretend to be. I love it. I worship it from afar. I've been to a few balls, but I've never walked anything or I'm not a, a part of a house or anything like that. But um, I love it. I worship it. I think it's incredible. There's a, also a great ballroom scene here in Buffalo. Really? Yeah. So, I'll put you up. I'll hook you up with some people. You can do a little interview. Because I'm used to hearing about the ballroom culture and the ballroom mm-hmm. scene in New York City, mm-hmm. the House of Extravaganza. Um, I'm familiar with with that with being in New York City. I'm yeah. not. I wasn't familiar with the ballroom culture here. So, yeah. Everything in Buffalo queer culture is like smaller. You know, we don't have in terms of population as many people so obviously our scene isn't going to be as big but like there's a pretty great small ballroom scene here it's really fantastic let's talk about your safety when you're performing the drag story hours across the country opponents and people who are against it have showed up to the story hours and protest do you ever feel concerned for your safety when you're performing that's uh sort of a, a a loaded question because anytime you you put on a wig and leave your house there's just an element of danger to it always is i don't know that i have personally felt at risk at my shows i have a lot of friends and sisters who have had their drag queen story i'm a i'm an adult <laughs> I do shows at bars, all right? And they are 21 plus, and I do not want children anywhere near them because I cuss like a sailor. <laughs> and I tell a lot of sort of blue humor. And I'm lucky to work in spaces that are like really cool and forward thinking. There are a lot of places that are not that way, even in liberal strongholds like New York. There are a lot of places that are that way. A sister of mine in Boston had people show up to her drag queen story hour with guns, like protesting. They didn't shoot them, but they had them. It's like, how, how are you so angry over someone like wearing a wig? And and here's the here, <laughs> I guess this actually kind of begs a, a, a deeper question, which is how is someone who is born with certain parts wearing a wig different than a young woman putting on a red wig and pretending to be Ariel at a birthday party? How is that different? I guarantee that she has chicken cutlets in her bra too. Like, we are essentially wearing the same thing, all right? <laughs> Except I had to shave a little bit more before she did. Like, the, it really is not different. So what you're saying is that you have a problem with who I am, not what I'm wearing. That is a problem. <laughs> that is a huge problem. These people are so hellbent on, like, <laughs> on, like, well, drag queens are ruining our kids. It's like, I, I can't name a single drag queen who wants to have children around. Like, I no, none of us want that <laughs> because we all like to tell blue humor and we like to you know we like to drink a little alcohol and we like to be you know fun i don't what's the right what's an appropriate npr word um <laughs> we don't want children around us just as much as we don't want them as you don't want them around us because it's like 
Unless that's specifically what the event is. My sister, Damsel in Distress, shout out, does um, a drag queen story hour over at a great bookstore over near the zoo called Alice Ever After. Yes. It's great. She's done it a couple times now, and it's always so well attended. But, like, I can't imagine there weren't protesters there. I live three blocks away from there. I can't imagine there weren't protesters there, which is insane. It's, like, across the street from giraffes. Like, <laughs> you're at the, you're literally at the zoo. You can see a giraffe over the thing, and, like, you're going to be there with a sign that's, like, drag ruins lives. No. Actually, drag saved my life, for the record. But, like, that, I can't. It's crazy. It's not different than a person at a birthday party wearing an aerial wig than me, two vodka sodas deep at 1 a.m. at a bar singing Part of Your World in a red wig. It's the same thing, except one is geared towards children and one is geared towards adults. It's like, don't get me started because I'll go. You change your act based on who you're performing for. That's plain and simple. You know how hard it's been for me to not curse on this program? (laughs) Change the act. (laughs) Let's talk about your look. Ah! What goes into your Mm. hair, your makeup, (laughs) dressing? I could imagine how high your bills must be. (laughs) Okay, read me. (laughs) Oh, my God, money. It's like I feel like I'm in a long con at this point. It's like, um, okay, and when do I start making money? It's like uh, I, I, uh, you know, a standard wig for like or like a good a good you can get a wig for 20 bucks, you know. But a good a good drag wig is gonna cost you like two to three hundred bucks. Your makeup supply, I mean, you wear makeup. How much is one makeup item? Probably ten bucks on average, twelve bucks on average. And if you want a good like a hello a, a Sephora brand or Ulta product for triple that, yeah. yeah, hello. So like, and you have to be able to like fit your color scheme to whatever. It is. So like, I have drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers of makeup that I have touched into an eyeshadow one time uh, that, you know, that's a $40 palette, but it's for a specific color. It's like, it's, it is so expensive. It's so expensive. Um, Outfits are insane unless you buy something on Fashion Nova, but then you're still gluing hundreds of dollars of rhinestones onto it to make it look like you didn't buy it from Fashion Nova. (laughs) It's like, it is so expensive. It is so expensive. I love it. I, I have wig walls in my home. And uh, I I love spending my money on wigs because who doesn't like wearing wigs? But it's expensive. How long does it take you to get ready? Mm. Depends. If I'm, uh, you know, I can do it in about an hour and 15 if I need to. But I can also do it in five if I want to. Uh, It's like uh, there are times and like follow me here. You know, when you're like, what a long week. I'm so exhausted. I'm, I'm brushing my hair for those who can't see with my fingertips. I'm so exhausted. I just like want to take a bubble bath and like read a book. Couldn't be me. I can't read. <laughs> Joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you like romance yourself to like unwind, I love doing that with my makeup where it's like, I'm just going to put a little eyeshadow on and then like, oh, let me go pour a glass of wine. And I like pour my little glass of wine and I come back and then bing bong, it's five hours later and I'm like finally ready. But I can do it if it's like um, brunch gigs. Oh my God, brunch gigs. Should be illegal for me. I it, You have to wake up at 7 in the morning to be there by 11 because you have to, like, shower, shave, the whole thing. And you're making sure your costumes are packed and steamed and your wigs are ready to go. But it's like, if you're waking up for brunch, I'm doing my makeup in 90 minutes. Out the door. Wow. <laughs> and, you, and they'll get sunglasses and a fierce lip. <laughs> and you just mentioned that makeup for you is, is therapeutic. Yeah. And I'm like, I feel like why I got into radio is because I hate doing my makeup. So <laughs> I'd rather. I, there are also times where I hate it, for the record, where I'm like, God, this again. On the third day of Pride, get back to me. All right. I'll be like, I'm going to. Uh, this sucks. I hate it. I can't get that cat eye right. The, oh. You got to let go and let God when it comes to makeup. Your eyes are supposed to be sisters, not twins. All right. And mine are, if I'm lucky, they're distant cousins. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the events that mm. you have going on. Yeah. So karaoke every Thursday. That is technically, that's, I do that every week. So that's every Thursday for the summer at Jackrabbit over on Elmwood. I believe it starts at, technically the poster says nine, but people show up at like seven and start singing. I show up when I want to show up. Uh, <laughs> and that is drag time. Uh, so every Thursday I do that. Talk about the experience working on Kinky Boots. Uh, it was kind of a crazy, I've never designed a show before. I, by trade, was an actor. 
like, can you call yourself? Who can ever call themselves an actor? Like Brad Pitt. I uh, So I grew up in the theater and got two degrees in it. So I've always been on the stage and kind of stopped doing theater a couple years ago after I graduated from grad school. I just like realized it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing doing anymore I love it I still go to the theater all the time but I was like the life of an actor is so stressful where it's like always waiting to hear about a job or like preparing for a callback or like waking up at four in the morning to go to an open call with like 400 other people who are skinnier and um, better than you it's like oh why am I wasting my time I couldn't take it anymore I didn't want to do it so I haven't done a show in a long time I happened to <laughs> I happened to get booked as like a surprise guest at a birthday party for Michael Oliver Walleen, who directed and choreographed the show. And actually it's funny, Golden, who we keep talking about, my sister Miss Golden Delicious, got booked to perform at his wedding as a surprise guest. And then I got booked into his birthday party as a surprise guest. <laughs> and he was like, you know, I start rehearsals for Kinky Boots in like a month, a month and a half or so. And I just want a real drag queen to like help me with the costumes and like maybe be a consultant or whatever it is. And he said, you know, let me get your number and and I'll see if we can get budget approval for it. And he called me about a week later and was like, hey, <laughs> You want to do it? And drag is my job. You know, it's, this is what I do. It's how I make my money. And so my days are pretty free. Don't talk to me about nights, but days are pretty free. <laughs> and I like thought about it. And my partner and I went out for, you know, a dinner. And I was like, I have, a, it's a month. I had a month to do everything. This a is a month. Yeah. Is that, is that's not typical. In... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You're usually rehearsing for weeks and weeks and weeks. And like you're doing fittings throughout the whole thing. And these are also actors who are not drag queens. So they don't know really how to do their makeup for drag. They don't know how to style a wig. They don't X, Y, and Z. So I said, I have a month to like essentially put six people through drag boot camp. And I really waited out and I was like, it's terrifying. But I think I'm going to do it. And I did. And, of course, then in the middle of it, I got so sick. <laughs> and I had to bust Golden in to, like, help with a lot of stuff. But it was great. Very rewarding. I I saw the show, obviously, every night of Tech Week. And then I saw it a few times throughout the run. And every time they came out in their finale outfits, which are, like, the big drag outfits for it, I got very emotional being like, oh, my God. That, like, that started as an idea in my mind. And now thousands and thousands of people have consumed it. Really cool. Like, it was a dream I didn't know I had. Would you consider doing it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Unless it's, you know, paying an insane amount of money. It was so, it was so much. We did, um, we did the math on we, how many rhinestones we glued on to the costumes for the show. And a gross of stones, that's the sort of measurement term, I believe is 140. All right. And so <clears throat> if you order rhinestones, usually they come in like 10 or 20 gross. They can come up to 100 gross. And I went back and looked through like my Amazon.com orders and counted how many bags I had ordered. And I, I believe when we did the math for, let's see, there were five angels and Lola. Each of the angels had five costumes. Lola had either eight or nine costumes. So math wise, that's like 30 to 40 costumes. For 30 to 40 costumes, we had almost 80,000 rhinestones. Wow. Individually glued on, one at a time. Impressive. In and an insane amount of rhinestones. Oh yeah, 80,000. <laughs> Hello. It's like it could fit a, a small room. Yeah, it's funny, Golden, Golden was like hired to sort of be my like assistant right because it's like oh you know we're stoning as much as we can but i i don't think i in it four weeks i can get costumes stone them and get them on people so i you know i hired golden and we keep calling her my stoner in chief because <laughs> she's just right <laughs> how long did it mm. take for you to make to finish one outfit okay so i have to think about this the what my my like main stoning project was lola's finale costume it was this beautiful um, sort of red, uh, like, cocktail-length, drapey sort of thing that I did uh, a sort of swirly pattern of rhinestones all over. And I was stoning it for about a week. I believe that costume alone had about 10,000 rhinestones on it. Stoning it for a week, several hours a day. I mean, to do that was probably, like, 30 to 40 hours. For one. For one costume. That one had more than some... of than all of the, <laughs> I will say, that had more than all the others. Golden did all their trench coats for a number called The Sexes in the Heel, and probably each one took like 
10 to 12 hours. I mean, it's just, I watched all of Dance Moms. <laughs> we'll say that. <laughs> Abby. It's seven, seven seasons, 40 some odd episodes every season, hour each. So we were we were flying Bin- through. <laughs> Binging and hot glue and gunning. Speaking of, Abby Lee, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> I'm obsessed with you. Let's talk about your education. Yeah. Off air, you mentioned um, you have a, you have a postgraduate uh-huh. degree. Yeah. And where do you have your postgraduate degree from? Because <laughs> I was when you when you said it, you, you just you just said it like. Eh. All my friends are gonna hear this and be like, "Of course you managed to mention this," because they like always joke that this is all that I talk about. I rarely mention it for the record. <laughs> um, I, I went. Uh, I went to the Cat South School for Nail Technology and Hair Divaness. Um, <laughs> I went to I went to grad school at. Uh, <laughs> I hate saying it because then it's like people are like, "Oh, you did." I went to Harvard. There, I said it. Harvard, yeah, an stupid. Ivy League. Too much money. <laughs> I spent too much money. An Ivy League university. <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't that crazy? Like the very beautiful, uh, annoying, dumb woman sitting before you, no, an no. Ivy graduate. <laughs> How how was that for you? Insane. Really crazy. You know, I was in the acting programs. We weren't really like, <laughs> like I wasn't Elle Woods. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to law school there. I I mean, I kind of was Elle Woods. On my first day of school, I, I stood under the gate and posted a picture that said, what, like it's hard? Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> how can you not? But, it, it you know, it was a different sort of experience being in the acting program. Like I wasn't writing papers and our big projects were shows. And it was crazy. I got to be in a lot of shows that were at that theater, which was the American Repertory Theater. Harvard owns the American Repertory Theater. It's a big regional theater that a lot of Broadway shows will come and like try out there and yeah. before they go to Broadway. Um, so I was on a couple big shows while I was there, which was amazing. I mean, experience that you actually couldn't get at any other theater. I got to um, be a swing on Waitress, which was Sarah Bareilles' show, on Natasha Pierre and The Great Comet of 1812, all these Tony-nominated and winning shows. It was amazing. But the craziest part was it's a sister program with the Moscow Art Theater School. So we did... In Russia. In Russia. We did a semester living in Moscow, which is like a bunch of queer people in the theater. Like... How? Lots of queer people living in Moscow for five months. Six How months. was that living in Russia? So beautiful. <laughs> no, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. It was so scary. I grew a beard <laughs> for the first time. Really? Surprised myself that I could. Although my makeup at the end of the night will beg to differ that I can't grow a beard. Um, yeah. No, I. I uh, we we lived in Moscow and we walked to school every day. Some people took the train. I walked. But you just kind of like put your headphones in, <laughs> look down. Why was it scary for you? It's a... Well, this was sort of in the, I don't know if in terms of timeline, I'm hazy on when it happened in terms of all the stuff in Chechnya. But like queer people were just. Were being executed. Executed. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, actually it was right before it was like things were bubbling as we were going over. So we were a little scared, a little, uh, very scared. We were very scared going over there, but they assured us that like. It's fine. You know, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is allegedly. Um, there are a lot of out celebrities in Russia because it's not illegal to be queer. The queer acts are what's illegal. So there are like out people in Russia, but like they can't kiss a partner in public or kiss a partner. Mm. Obviously, if there's no police watching them. <laughs> They're gonna be doing what they want to. Then go for it. But like, but like, in, can't do it in public. Can't uh, hold hands. Can't uh, any of that. I don't know if any of that is still true or what laws have changed or whatever. But like, the, uh, allegedly there are out out people there. It was just scary. It was very scary. Learned a lot though. I mean, I can speak very basic Russian, which is insane. Like the women on the train when I was in the city who would be speaking Russian about me. It, I'm riding the train in full drag, talking about me. I'd be like, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I know you're talking about me, but yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Do you have any advice for people who want to perform in drag? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. Um, yeah. Um, you know, we talked about this earlier, but it's like know know who you are before you do it, really. You can be young and, and still know that, but like um but know uh know who you are and why you want to do it. Um because like anyone can put on a wig. And lip sync to Rihanna for three to five minutes. Love. Easy. Um, But if you're doing it for the right reasons, 
or to affect change or to, um, you know, I feel like my platform's a bit bigger than if I don't have the wig on. Um, like, know, know why, why you're doing it. And it can just be to, like, make people laugh. That's what I like to do. I'm not really a big political person. I'm I obviously, <laughs> I've gotten involved in politics because, you know, being a drag queen is a political act these days. But um, know, know who you are. How can people reach out to you if they want to go to your events mm. or follow you or keep up with what Vanna Do is, is doing? <laughs> well, do if the, they want to do the do. If yeah. they want to do the do. That's D-E-U-X, though, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, Instagram is great. I've noticed that a lot of people in Buffalo are like Facebook people, which is strange to me. I feel like Facebook is, at least to me, like in the past. Uh, whatever. Um, so pl- please don't add me on Facebook because I do not check my Facebook. But I- Instagram and Twitter are like my social media things. It's at Vanadu, V-A-N-N-A-D-E-U-X. Check it pretty regularly. Vanadu, mm. thank you so much for coming. Thank you. What a key. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Buffalo What's Next. Our region is home to some of the finest communities in the world. Explore them through the Our Town series produced by WNED PBS, but captured by community members on the Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube channel today. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Recently, I had a chance to go to the Buffalo Arts Studio for the opening of a piece called Tales from the Porch. This is created by an artist who we've talked to before here on Buffalo What's Next, Itina Fareed Cook. In this particular case, though, she has extended her Tales from the Porch efforts and opened it up to five other artists from Western New York. And one of those artists is with us this morning, and her name is Caitlin Lowe. Caitlin, thanks for joining us. It's beautiful to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a a little more about what Itina was doing. This is uh, something that she was able to put together with the Buffalo Art Studio with some support from Creatives Rebuild New York's Artist Employment Program. So actually, you and your four other cohorts got paid to yes. do this. Yes, yes, yes. That's always a nice thing, right? Oh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. We we need money. No matter how much we hate it, we need it. <laughs> That's right. And it's interesting because you, we were talking before we went on the air how there's the old version of the or vision of the starving artist and then the one who makes it successful Mm -hmm. and you're saying that there's a middle space yes that you have been able to find yes i'm 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 finally seeing it so uh this is something that my mom and i have struggled with pretty much my whole life uh the only thing that i was 100 percent positive on is that i wanted to be in the art world in some way shape or form and she was kind of just like yeah, I want to support you, but how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to survive? Like, like what's, what's happening? We need to figure out a plan for that. And I kind of was just like, I don't like your plan. <laughs> 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 she wanted me to to work in a, a office job, something that's, that's steady so I can always have the, the income. And I 100% understand that. But I also know that my soul would not be filled. So... I needed to figure out another way to do that. And this was one of the opportunities that I've had to prove to her and myself that it's it's possible to find a middle ground and to just be an up-and-coming person and to be able to sustain yourself a little bit. And it's interesting to hear how you said you knew from a pretty young age that arts was where you needed to be. Can you t- describe that, so, that yearning? <laughs> okay, so... My parents had me kind of young, not like teenager young, but my mom was 21. And so uh, she was very much enthralled in hip hop. So she would put her headphones on her stomach so I would listen to it. And so that's my that was my first interaction with art. But when I got to middle school, my mom was kind of like, "Okay, I see you do all of those creative things. 
you should probably be trying to make money off of this. And so I started making bookmarks. I started uh, making jewelry and getting into high school. I'm editing pictures for people for fun, which is very funny now. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, just the culmination of all art things, if it's some way I can dip my toe in it, I'm, I'm in love with it. That's that's just how I feel about art. Even with even with clothing, for one of the the subjects for the photos, I painted the designs on his sweater. So uh, if I had the time, I would have made jewelry for every single person, but that did not work out. It, but art is the thing. <laughs> right. When I went to the opening of uh, at the Buffalo Art Studio, there was I Tina uh, put on a performance, and you opened with your yes. poem. <laughs> Borough Hearts? Yes, Borough Hearts, yes. Let's listen to that. Hey, yo, my stoop is for the inner city deviants, a.k.a. a Spike Lee joint, live and in color. No lawn, but we stand strong on cement and stone, brown like soil, bones adorned and gold, bold, bright smiles wide, you know. Everybody loves the sunshine type of vibes. Bamboozling boys armed with balls and bottle caps. Four little girls turning phone cables called antecedents each step. Oracles within reach play chess while adulthood is gained. Over a game of spades, no less. Yes, we spent summers with cousins cracking pavement by bike. Sprinkle of cyphers only to stop for bodega cat sightings. Lullabies from late night locomotive sway Romeo and Juliet. Two star-crossed lovers from different hoods or worse. Two train lines that don't intersect, and while some were born with silver spoons, we caught brass forks for tongues, coated in pizza sauce, sharp as the ear, flavor of touch is the standard, customary for good kids in the mad city, sliced by dollars. Don't ask why we so tough. Lady Liberty's covered in green patina, what you think that does to us? To see a reflection of what's supposed to be we, submerged in filthy waters, seemingly blind to how puppet hands control us, expressways rezone neighborhood homes if Buyers don't catch them first. Slum lords let tenants suffer for lack of dollars while we work the concrete jungle feverishly. Soften in pavement for ages in heat just for cranes in the sky to favor replacements deviously. It's easy to see when I return to what I thought was home is gone. My brother's barbershop, a loft. The Chipotle's and little cafes galore. It's like I'm not even welcome here anymore. Yet all strikes like matches the moment I pass my faction. I see New York City and they walk, they talk, they heart, they action. No matter how much has changed or claimed disdain, no one can take our magic. I mean, the unnamed even tried to put bars in our baby's windows to keep us stagnant like we not alchemists and turn lead pressures by accident. The black matter within is permanent. Our burrows are better than our souls. So even with no porch or place to go, in our hearts reside the abode. When it's art... You let the, the receiver absorb it for themselves. But what about it? What can you tell me? What kind of background can you give me? Itina is my mentor because I kind of stalked her <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Like, I, I saw some things that she was doing. I watched her perform once, and I was like, this woman needs to be in my life. I don't care how. It's going to happen. Okay. And uh, our next connection that we were able to make was a walk and capture workshop where we did photography, and we were in the the neighborhood of her church just running around taking street photography and then we also worked to add poems to really respond to that that photo work and so i wrote a a piece i saw a man carrying a shopping cart mm. and it kind of just it, it tapped into something for me and so I kind of was inspired a little bit by that poem, and I was also inspired by Jillian Hainsworth, who introduced the uh, Tales from the Porch exhibit through her videos with Itina. She's like the first thing to, to kick it off. And I kind of said to myself, if I made something specifically from the lens of being a New Yorker, what do I want to say? And what's important to me without... Being her poem, being uniquely my own, and also finding a way to just make people feel seen and, and heard. So uh, I feel a large level of displacement um, back home in New York City. Gentrification is a very strong thing. Um, and 
I'm from Fort Greene, so literally my neighborhood was one of the first to be gentrified. And so every time I come back home, and we've moved a little bit too, so anytime I just happen to go into the area, I see the changes. Mm -hmm. But it still feels like this is my home and this is where I belong. Even even to the, the fact of me being in Buffalo for as long as I've been here. I came here for school in 2014, and uh, most of my friends and family forced me, like, when are you coming back home? When are you coming home? Or, you're not really a New Yorker. You, you're a <laughs> Buffalonian. And it's like, no, this is, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. And also, it's not, it's, it's some beautiful things, but it's not always the most positive thing and I feel like that's kind of really just a culmination of what New York is pushing through and persevering the borrowed heart uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) being the the borough is my heart but also it feels a little bit buried so I'm going to just try to bring it out for you and myself and interesting about gentrification you know Brooklyn of course I mean it's it's been an amazing change from when I was a kid (laughs) Brooklyn you know I'm I'm not from that area but Knowing about Brooklyn, it's obviously a major, amazing change. We're hearing a little bit more about that, though, even in the city of Buffalo. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's coming. Yeah. It's been coming, and I've been watching it. <laughs> yeah. What do you, are you hearing from people about that? Are they, I mean, is there a sense? Is there a fear? What, what, I mean, again, I, it's interesting to always talk to an artist because an artist seems to receive, understand, communicate in different ways, maybe, than people like me. I, I believe that the people who are really talking about gentrification don't have that much power to do things beyond it. Mm. So uh, I recently had to move because my landlord tried to raise my rent about $400 and my ceiling caved in. (laughs) So, I mean, for for multiple reasons, I was like, there's no way. (laughs) That's not happening. And so uh, by the time that I'm trying to figure out new housing and places to move, I'm hearing about other people who I know that are artists and listening to their stories. Some of them couldn't find a place for years. Uh, Other people, like, I'm I'm even just like being on the street and eavesdropping into conversations. People are talking about this and cannot find a place to live. I think that the conversation has been around landlords and I can understand being an individual person and that's one way that you're generating income. But I also feel like we can't forget about the impact that a lot of corporations have in this city a lot of these buildings are owned by the same few companies and uh people are living in squalor and are paying top dollar to live like that to live with uh fungus and growing in their apartments to live with water damage to live with locks that don't lock to not have security to to have to step over animal fecal matter you know there there's so there's so many things just to avoid being homeless yes exactly just to avoid being homeless and the area that i live in now is surrounded by homeless people so it feels like a a never ending kind of like cycle of i am upset about this thing i'm going to talk about it but the people that I'm talking to about it are kind of in the same position. But what can we what can we do? Can I go on strike? But if I go on strike and nobody else goes on strike, I'm just going to get evicted. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like I think that we need to look at the the way that money is being dispersed into the cities who's getting uh funding to take on more projects. Where's how many new apartment buildings and lofts are rising when people can't afford to even feed themselves even even on like the bare bones of necessities like the government recently rolled back a lot of the covid protocols and for food stamps cut (laughs) so it's a i for a, a long time was feeling nervous about what would happen in buffalo in terms of like rising rents and other things because there are people coming to the city because People are starting to realize that Buffalo has a lot of power, whether it be like the ability to move forward financially, spiritually, any of these things. Like there's there is a wealth of power here. But the people who are <laughs> at higher positions and they're and it's easier for the for them to attain certain things, they're kinda just like slicing and dicing and the middleman slash lower class working class is kind of just suffering for that. 
Caitlin Lowe, thanks for uh, sharing that. And maybe we can uh, take a moment to breathe just a little <laughs> bit. Or I'll, I'll, I'll do the breathing. Actually, and you'll do the uh, performing. Uh, you have another piece here called Saturn Man. Yes. I have dreams. I see a man on Saturn trying to tap me. I see he look free. He see me small. Almost not at all. But he call us to me. Vibrations catch the beat. He play like Morse code. Tapping out. Searching for my soul. Well, I can only hear blues. Searching for answers I won't find in the news, news, news. Flash, black girl, this is not your world. Your pearls lie elsewhere. Go there. Funk this place you stay that can't face facts. That put a target on your back. Read black face back. Grab a hand or two. This journey is not only for you. Reads two skin folk. Pick out the fro. A beacon of hope and let them flock to the sunflower field. Get one last feel for Mother Earth where your reflection roots in the dirt, never mud, and rises above in search of sun, someone like life. The Saturn man to bring you closer to the bright side. Non-believers cut their eyes, cut their ties, ascend to the sky for space. The new place to stay. No disarray. Greet sunrise with love. And continue to tap to reach the souls not strong enough. So Saturn Man was about Sun, Sun Ra. Ra. Yep. What uh, what drew you to Sun Ra? I guess this is all getting back to college. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I took a intro to Afrofuturism class, oh. and um, I'll admit, as a child, when it came to art, I was pretty selfish. If I did not see myself in the story, whether it be a black person or a, a woman, I wasn't really interested. And so that closed off the door for science fiction a lot of the times. But through that class, I was able to realize that, oh, there's a lot more to this thing than I thought. And so I remember having to watch the film and I was kind of like, this dude is weird. He's like, he's like really weird, <laughs> but it, for it, it spoke to me because uh, for those who haven't seen the film, uh, Space is the Place is really kind of like the way it starts is Sun Ra is like, hey, listen, black people, y'all have been through some stuff because of systematic whatever whatevers. And I'm trying to make a space for you so we can see how you survive and thrive without all of those uh, negative setbacks. And so that place is going to be Saturn and we will be trans translating transmuting transporting you through music in any other way <laughs> and so the film he kind of like goes around and is collecting and kind of like recruiting black people to go with him to space to saturn to find a better life and he's also playing chess with the devil for the the hand of black people caitlin lowe is our guest uh artist poet filmmaker what about here in Buffalo? What inspires you in Buffalo? There is, honestly, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, positive and negative. Number okay. one, the Buffalo love, the, the love that people have from this for their city is inspiring. And I have that same kind of love. So I, I just appreciate seeing that. I love street photography. And I know that there's some people who interact with that idea in a voyeuristic way, and I don't like that, but people inspire me. Sometimes it's just like biking by and, and seeing somebody uh, who's wearing yellow when they're uh, watering their grass in front of their yellow house, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, there's, there's moments where just the things that people don't think matter that much that's the thing that that inspires me those those small moments because I find poetry in those moments also you're on Instagram at the Galactic Grio or I should say the dot Galactic Grio and Grio G-R-I-O-T 
A griot is somebody that is part of a band of traveling storytellers, poets, musicians, historians, and uh, this goes back to to West Africa. And the griots, like this is their class of being. They're put here to create art, to keep stories alive. Oral storytelling is really the a lot of the main focus, and that is something that I genuinely feel like I relate to being an African American. So automatically, a lot of my ancestry comes from West Africa, uh, and that's what I want to do. I want to tell stories. I want to do that through art, through poetry, and also add a little bit of historical context. I think that if if uh, somebody were to hear this poem in 50 years or 100 years, they'd understand the perspective of a young black person in this time period. So uh, that's what I'm doing. Caitlin Lowe, thanks for coming in and, uh, and doing that with us today and sharing with us here on Buffalo What's Next. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a, an amazing conversation and I'm happy to be here. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN only and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. For decades, they've been spaces for queer, black, and brown people to live their best lives. What should we know about modern ballroom culture today? From WAMU and NPR in Washington, this is 1A. Hi, I'm Jen White. Ballroom's story reaches back to the Harlem Renaissance, but the scene we know today really took off in the 70s. The houses back then were founded by black trans women who created spaces of resistance and love. Today, their cultural power is key to communities who were under attack then and are under attack now. Today, we hear more about the role ballroom continues to play, both as a place to find chosen family and as a part of the fight for equality. And we'd love to share your stories too. Email us at 1A at WAMU.org.